Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study. The book of Galatians, chapter 3. We're going to pick it up uh, starting in verse 5 through 9. I already have a, a theme ready for today. So then they which be of faith. And later on, we know by studying uh, the book of Galatians that Paul in chapter 4 is going to talk about uh, Abraham a little bit further. And we're going to talk about Abraham today. But we know in Galatians 4, he lists out the two sons of Abraham. One Ishmael and then Isaac. And then he separates the two. And he makes the analogy by way of the Holy Ghost. He's telling you this is an allegory. And it doesn't mean that it's a fable made up to taught some, teach some kind of spiritual lesson. What it means is, is that it is a real life event. God brought this about. God let it happen. Uh, speaking of Sarah saying to Abraham, hey, uh, why don't you take my slave girl, Hagar, okay? Why don't you sleep with her? Said no wife ever, <laughs> okay? I mean, you just have to just kind of think about the mindset of Sarah here, uh, or I should say Sarai, because her name wasn't Sarah yet when this took place. And there's a very, very important thing about that, and I'll get to that. Uh, but anyway, the two sons of Abraham represent those who are born in bondage, those who are born uh, free. And Hagar's son, Ishmael, represents those who are born of Mount Sinai under the law. Sarah's son, Isaac, represents those who were born free, were not in bondage. All right, And I'll explain that as we go along. <clears throat> because those who are of faith cannot be of works, and those who are of works cannot be of faith. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot say, well, I'm of faith and works at the same time, or of grace. You can't have it that way. It has to be one or the other. And so those who are of faith, which means I have zero confidence in my own ability to be righteous before God. My confidence then is solely upon the righteousness of Christ and not of my own works. It's one or the, you're going to pick one or the other. And if God loves you like he loves me, what God will do or has already done, he's already taken you down a road to show you that your own self-righteousness will fail you. It will leave your life a miserable wreck. And you'll realize that you can't do it. That Christ will already did and that's who you trust and so we're going to get into the life of Abraham we're going to see how God blessed Abraham even before he was Abraham God blessed him and I'll get into that let's read the text Galatians chapter 3 let's pick it up in verse 5 he therefore that ministereth to you the spirit and worketh miracles among you doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. What we're going to do is we're going to go back and look at the life of Abraham. And we're going to see what Paul was talking about here, where he was quoting from, that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And if you are the seed of Abraham, not, one, not the seeds of Abraham, like God is including Ishmael and Isaac together, it's not what he said. One seed, one line, one generation. Those who are, uh, let me read verse 7 again. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen. That's us. We're the heathens. God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And we're going we're gonna to go back and we're going to look at the exact scriptures. And we're going to see the, the continuity of the Bible, the cohesiveness, that it is not speaking of uh, two or three or four different segregated ways that God brought people to heaven, the way some who are of a, I would say, a hyper-dispensational belief or 
maybe others who know nothing of dispensationalism would, would say that all they, back in the Old Testament, they were saved by works of the law. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. Abraham was justified and, and righteousness accounted to him by his faith before he ever did anything. God granted him righteousness. And um, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto him. In other words, before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, before Jesus came and died and was resurrected and provided the means of salvation, God had already provided Abraham with the blessing of righteousness by his faith. It was preached before the gospel. God's plan was always to be this way. Don't fall into this idea that all, oh, you know, in the tribulation, they're going to have a different gospel and that gospel is going to be of works and they're going to have to continue while we here in this dispensation, we don't have to do anything. We don't continue in anything. We could fall out and become lesbian witches, atheists, and still go to heaven. We can take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. There's people who believe that nonsense. That's ignorant. One gospel throughout all the generations, God justifies people by faith. The just shall live by faith. That's an Old Testament doctrine, all right? God said it in the Old Testament before we ever came along in the New Testament. One gospel continuously throughout the ages. Let's go back and look then at, at what Paul was, was reaching for here in Galatians 3. And when he was talking about Abraham, um, let's see here. It says uh, in verse 8, in thee shall all the nations be blessed. Um, God foreseeing that, uh, let's see here, back here, it was uh, in verse 6, it was counted to him for righteousness, Abraham believed God. We're going to go back in the Old Testament and find these places where God said that. We're going to draw a circle around them so that we get the context. We're going to walk circumspectly around these particular passages to see what God was saying. We're going to go back to Genesis chapter 12. Now, let me just throw something in here. Uh, many, many moons ago, many years ago, when I was starting to study numbers, I wanted to know what the numbers meant. And um, I felt like that I was getting from God that the, the number meanings would be in the Genesis chapter. In other words, the order of, of the very beginning of the Bible just sort of spoke of what a particular number meant. Genesis 1, 1 is about beginnings, primary things, the first things and so on. Um, Genesis 2, uh, the number 2 there, uh, it means uh, unity. God took man, divided him in two, made two people. The two became one again. Uh, the number 3 is a number for resurrection, but it's a number for sin. Uh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And that's what you see in Genesis 3. Um, you see the gospel there, Genesis 4, and so on. When you get to Genesis 12, you're looking at the number 12. What does the number 12 mean? It represents God's promise, all right? Um, think of the city, New Jerusalem, and how it has uh, 12 gates for the 12 tribes. It has 12 foundation stones of the apostles, the 12 apostles. And it basically represents the fulfillment of God's promise both to Abraham and those who are of the seed of Abraham. And he promises that city. That, so that's the, and by the way, it's 144. There's 144,000, which is 12 times 12,000. Uh, even the, the word Jerusalem in the New Testament, you look this up to your Bible search software, type in the word Jerusalem, it's 144 times in the New Testament, 12 times 12, all right? So anyway, the number 12 represents God's promise. Let's look at Genesis 12 to see if that's there. In verse 1, now the Lord had said unto Abram, very important that we look at the fact that Abram had a name change later on in Genesis 17. Uh, there's another number there and the meaning of it in Genesis 17. Uh, the number 17 is a number for transformation. You see that change there. But Abram is still Abram, not Abraham. A name change always coincides with salvation. God will give us a new name. Uh, there's a new name written down in glory. That's an old gospel song I have in my head. But anyway, the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee, 
and I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Well, that's what uh, was being uh, written here in Galatians. Paul was referencing Genesis 12 when he said in Galatians 3, 8, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. And he said, In thee shall all the families, which nations of the earth, be blessed. And it, when he said, In thee, he was referring to what or who was in his loins. And who was in his loins was Jesus. He was there. He was passed down to Isaac. He was passed down to Jacob. He was then passed down to Judah, who passed him through Perez. We have the line of Perez going from, uh, let's say, um, Obed, then to Jesse, then to David, and then David through Solomon with Bathsheba, and then on down. You can trace the lineage there in uh, back Matthew chapter 1 all the way down to Jesus. Jesus being in the loins of Abraham, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Blessed is a salvation word. If you are blessed, you are set. And let me give you evidence of that. If I say it, I got to be able to back her up, right? Let's go to, uh, oh, let's see here. You can look at um, Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Very important to remember, I may get to that this morning. Um, blessed are they uh, that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are uh, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In Psalm 32, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is a man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no God. There's four things here in these two verses. That blessing is having your sins forgiven, and having your sins covered, and then having the righteousness of Christ being imputed to you. You are now blessed. If you are blessed... You cannot be cursed. You cannot be blessed and cursed at the same time. Something very important to remember for some of you who have been told that oh, you're uh, the reason why you uh, <clears throat> the reason why you still curse a lot and have foul mouth is you have generational curse on you, and uh, that needs to be lifted. And uh, you know we have this little prayer ceremony and we use oil and we have these ritual of words that we say and we're going to lift that. Listen, the curses were lifted at Calvary. All curses are gone at Calvary. All those curses that mankind has on him were laid upon Christ and he died and destroyed them in his death. They have no power over you. Don't let anybody give you that nonsense and lie. You curse because you're a sinner. You have a sin, wicked nature in you that as time goes on, God purges these things from us. One day at a time, one sin at a time, one little piece at a time, not all at once, but then he purges us from our iniquities. Have patience with God. He's having patience with you. He will deliver you from these things. He'll take these things away or he'll give you grace. That's what he promised Paul concerning his thorn. But you cannot have a curse on you and be blessed as a Christian at the same time. It's not possible. So anyway, the blessing is a salvation word. But anyway... Here's, here's what's interesting to me, is that Abram now is being promised a country, a land. And we're going to see from the Bible what that entails. That, yes, there is an earthly land that God promised to the seed of Abraham. But that is a foreshadowing of a heavenly land that God promised to him. We're going to see it in the Bible. It, it is a foreshadowing of, the, of a greater blessing that comes by being of the seed of Abraham. Um, he says it in Genesis 12, he calls him Abram. Before God calls him by his new name, he is already giving the promise. Now, something to think about. You'll find uh, a little bit about Abram mentioned in Genesis 11. You know that he comes from Haran, and uh, the Bible talks a little bit about it there. But between Genesis 11 and Genesis 12, just to ask you a question, those of you who think that these people were saved by personal righteousness or acts of obedience or they did something for God or whatever it was, 
when God gives Abram this blessing, get thee out of thy country, and I will make, a great, uh, make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee, make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, so on and so forth. When God made these promises to Abram, what work of righteousness did Abram do to deserve or to merit God already laying upon him these blessings? What was it? The Bible records nothing that Abram did to where, whereby he merits them these blessings that God promised him in Genesis 12. The blessings that God gave Abram were pretty much unconditional. God knowing that Abram would believe God and perform what he said. But his performance, when God said, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. Abraham already believes God. He's not working and go. He's not saying, well, I don't know if this is true, but I'm going to leave and then we'll see. Then we'll see if what God said was true. When I get to that land, I see it flowing with milk and honey. Then I'll believe it. He already believed it. He already believed. What, and that's what caused him to get up. It's what caused him to pack it. You know, uh, Sir Abraham, his servants come to him. What are we doing? God has told me that he is going to make a great nation out of me even though I have no children. And God has promised me a land that is not part of the land of my fathers. And I just believe what God said. We're going. And that's all there is to it. Yes, sir, Abraham, master. Let's go do it, okay? Abraham already believes what God said, and that's what causes him to rise up, pack his things up, and move his family to a land that he's never known before. It's not the land of his fathers, not the land of his nativity. He's just going there, and what God is doing is God is showing us in Abraham. God has called us to a different country, a different land. It's, it's a land that we have not seen before. It's a land that we've never been to. Now, I've been to a lot of places uh, in this country. Uh, I've traveled through this country by air, by van. I've seen a lot of things. I've been to different places in the world. I can't say that I've seen every place in the world. But God has called me to a new land, a country that does not belong to my fathers. My ancestry, as it were, comes from Arkansas, from North Carolina, back to uh, England. Okay, It's about my son kind of traced the, the heritage of the family and he traced it back to England. That's not the land that God's promising us. The land that he's giving us is a land, eternal land in heaven. So the, the analogy is, is that God is calling us out of this world and he's going to give us a land, a new land that our fathers had not known. And I hope you understand that symbolism because that's what he's showing us here. And those of us who are of faith, we are of Abraham, these promises apply. They apply to the literal seed where God is going to restore them in the last days. And I absolutely believe that. But it also applies to us who are of the seed of Abraham by faith, whereby God says, I will bless them that bless you, and I'll curse them that curse you. And I'll just say this, God takes care of his own, and God watches out for them. And all the things that are done to you, all the things, all the rotten things that people said about you, the pe that people did to you, how they betrayed you, how they treated you bad, how they persecuted you, how they did all these things, they turned their back on you. God was watching. And God said, I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse them that curse you. And those who mistreat God's people, when God's people have done nothing wrong, those people are going to receive a judgment for that. That's the word of God, all right? And I don't think I'm taking anything out of the con. I don't think I'm taking anything out of Israel. I'm not replacing the literal seed of Abraham. What I'm saying is because we have been grafted in, we are the recipients of these promises by faith. And so we are of that great nation and of those people that God promised and that God was talking about how he's going to lift us up out of this land, out of this earth, and take us into a new land. Um, if we go to Hebrews 11, 
we see, which is talking about faith. All these things that these people in the Old Testament did were, had been done by faith, not by works. It wasn't by what they did that God blessed them. Again, we go to the picture of Abraham here. What was it that Abraham did or Abram did that merited God just showing up and say, Abram, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your seed. I know you don't have any kids. I'm going to give you a mess of them. I'm going to use, you're going to have your kids running all over the place. All right? That's what I'm going to do for you, Abram. But why? Because I love you. Because I know what you will do. And I know that you are a man of faith and you'll believe me. Okay? God already knows that. He has that foreknowledge of everything that we are going to do. And so that's how God selects us. We look at uh, Hebrews 11. It sort of explains this, this land concept that it's a country that we have never seen before. And it's not of this earth. We are going to inherit a new heaven and a new earth. Hebrews 11 verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, which means he went to the land of Canaan as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The real city, the real country that Abraham is looking for, that Abraham was promised, was not of this world. Verse 11, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. And I, I've pointed this out several times. When you go look at Sarah, especially in Genesis 18, when Jesus showed up, when the Lord showed up with those two angels, and he's, and he's giving the promise again to Abraham. Abraham, and this, by this time Abraham has his new name. And, and the Lord says to him, I'm going to give you a son through Sarah. Sarah's in the tent laughing because she don't believe it. And so when the Lord calls her out on it, she's going, I, I didn't laugh. It wasn't, that wasn't me. That was, I sneezed. I was, you know, I was cooking and I sneezed. She was lying through her teeth. He said, you did too, laugh. And he said, I promise you from a year from now, you'll be laughing with joy because you're going to be holding your son in your arms. I promise you. You see, the Lord could have looked at Sarah and said, oh, you laughed at me? No. Well, I'm not giving you anything then. How's that? Huh? How's that? You get what you deserve. That's not what he did. He had already sworn. He had already made his promise. He wasn't going to go back on it. And I think at that time, Sarah finally said, I think he means what he says. I think I'm going to believe what the Lord has told me. And a year from now, I'm going to be holding my baby, not Hagar's, not somebody else's kid. I'm going to be holding mine. Okay? So she believed. Verse 12, therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead. Think about that. Here is the child of promise springing from Abraham and, and, and Sarah, who are, the Bible says are as good as dead. Think about that phrase. What good are dead people? Nothing. What good was Lazarus laying in that tomb four days? He was, <laughs> there isn't anything good about a dead body laying four days. I guarantee, I've been there, I've seen it, I'm telling you, there's nothing good about it. He's as good as dead. He is the old man bringing forth the new man, the child of promise. That's Christ. So he said, he's good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. See, the phrase afar off in your King James Bible is a future word. It always points to something that's in the future, future, future. Okay? And were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They were saying, we don't belong here. It's not our home. It's not, a, it's not the place where we belong. This is not where I want my reward to be given to me. This is not where I want my best life now. 
Amen. Verse 14, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. There it is right there. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them. I said, can you imagine that? How many things have you done in life that, number one, you're ashamed of? Number two, you might be, as certain people that I've known in life, the outcast, the black sheep of the family, the one that you've done so many things, people are just tired of your nonsense, people are just tired because they know you make these promises, yeah, I'm going to try to live right, and you're right back drinking, chasing, you know, women or men or whatever it is, you're back to doing drugs, you're back to doing this and doing that. And people are ashamed of you. But God looks at you and says, I got a house up here with your name all over it. Your name's on the front post. Your name's in the driveway. Your name's on the front door. Your name's on the mailbox. And God says, I'm not ashamed of you. I'm not, what? You're my son. I'm not ashamed of you. I've rebirthed you into a greater thing than you could ever imagine for yourself. So how could I be ashamed of you? I've prepared a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Boy, that is so sweet. Now go to Genesis 13, and what we'll do, I got a lot of scripture here, but what we'll do is we'll go, we'll look at this land, and God's going to reiterate this in Genesis 13. If you know that story, that's where Lot's herdsmen and Abraham's, or Abram's herdsmen, they were fighting over wells, pasture land, you know, spring water. Because all the cattle, they were all fighting about who was going to get to the well first and who was going to get the grasslands first and who was going to get this and who's going to get that. And remember, Lot was taken in by Abraham, Abram, excuse me. Lot's father died, and so Abram took him in, probably at a young age, and um, just kind of combined Lot's inheritance with Abram's for a time till Lot comes of age and finally, you know, they're ready to separate off. There's a valuable lesson here. So in Genesis 13, let's pick it up in verse 5. Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. The land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together. It's very important. For their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. Now, let me just say this. I've been in, been in church all my life, just about. And I've seen Christians fight. I've seen it, I've been through it, I've done it myself, and to be honest with you, it's not possible that every one of us who call ourselves by the name of Jesus Christ, it's not possible that we can all live together in the same hut. Some people just, their ways are weird, and while they look at you and say the same thing, your ways are strange to me. Who's right? Who's wrong? Well, we're all liars, according to the Bible. And I've learned that <clears throat> when it comes to people that, let's say they're in your church and, you know, you've, you've raised them up in the church and they're reading the Bible, they're reading the same Bible you are, but they see things a little differently. Okay? Let God be true and every man a liar. And I've just learned that sometimes it, it, it's best to separate. And most of the time, that separation is going to be adversarial. There's going to be a fight. There's going to be words that were said. There's going to be bitterness over it. Okay? I'm just, that's just how it is. I hate it. I guess it's part of the curse of sin that we still are under. But just because somebody got mad and had words with you and left, that does not mean that they were wrong. They may have had a wrong attitude. They may not have said it right. You may, you may have had a bad attitude. doesn't mean that you are necessarily wrong either. What God does is that he separates us. Okay? 
You stay over there. You serve me, but you stay over there. You serve me, but you stay over there. And block each other on Facebook because I don't want you guys looking at each other's stuff and going, well, how come he's doing that? And he's doing that wrong. I wouldn't. That's none of your business. Mind your own. Shut up. Sit down. Mind your own business. That's God all the time as with us children. Why don't, you, why don't you sit over there? You sit over there and quit talking to one another. I mean, it happens. Esau and Jacob, he, they came together. And Esau said, you know what? We, we don't belong together. Okay. I'm going to be nice about it, but I don't want to ever see you again. Okay, who was it? Laban that chased down uh, Jacob. And, you know, he laid about threats and said, oh, I've got it in my power to kill you. I ought to kill you right now. And, and they finally put a stone there and they said, we're going to let this, this Mizpah right here, this Mizpah stone is going to judge between me and you. If I cross this line on your side and I mean harm, God's going to watch it and God's going to get me. And if same thing with you. If you cross this stone, this stone's going to watch you. And if you mean harm to me or my family, God's going to get you. Is that, is that agreed? Yeah. And they, they split up. Uh, Paul and John Mark. John Mark accompanied Paul for part of his first journey. John Mark fell out, couldn't keep up, couldn't handle the rigors, couldn't handle the stress. <laughs> Paul's a stressful guy to be around. Paul was just running, 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 didn't have a family to hold him down, didn't have a wife that he had to call about every hour and say, honey, I'm, I'm okay, you want, you want me home now? Well, I'm, I'm pretty, Paul didn't have that. He was free, man, amen. John Mark had a wife and kids probably back home, and he's going, I miss my wife and kids, and he left, and Paul was mad at him because he wanted to go again on the second journey. And the Bible says that the words between Paul and John Mark were heated yelling at one another. Finally, Barnabas stepped in and said, come here. I got a solution here. I'm going to go, I'm going to go this way, Paul. I'm going to take John Mark with you. You take Luke. You guys just run and run and run and run until you can't run no more. We're going to go over this way and kind of do some things over there. And that's how it was done. And God blessed both of them. And I'm not saying that we should never fight. We should never disagree because we're going to. What I'm saying to you is, is that there are times when it becomes obvious that we need to separate just to make sure that the kingdom of God is not brought into disrepute by our arguments. The world doesn't need to see us fighting one another. The world doesn't need to see us having words. And my instinct and my nature is when somebody crosses me, I want to I blast them publicly. That's what I want to do. There's been times I've done that, and I've had to repent of it. I had to go back and say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Okay? I still disagree with you, but I should not have made the scene that I did. It wasn't right. And I'm just telling you, get ready for times like that, because they're going to come. Abraham and Lot, now, they could not dwell together. In verse 7, and there was strife between the herdmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. They're fighting. Okay? And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Canaanite Perizzites watching these guys. Who are these? Who are these? Who are these? Who is this Abraham? I heard that he was like God's special man, but boy, it seems like a lot of fighting in his family. I don't know about these guys. They, I, I just don't know that their ways are better. And that's how the world sees this stuff, people. They see us fighting one another. They don't. They don't want that. They want to go to their bar where everybody knows their name and they get along with everybody. And if there's a bar fight, they beat each other up, wipe the dust off each other, get right back in the bar, okay? Lost people sometimes don't act this way. But I'm just saying separate. And Abram knew that. Abram was meek now. Um, let me read this. Matthew chapter 5, 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Watch Abram. Watch what he does here. So verse 8, And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. We ought not be doing this. It's not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Now here's what Abraham or Abram could have done. Abram could have said, You know what, Lot? You wouldn't be anything without me. I took you in when your daddy died. I took you in, raised you like you were my son, gave you this field, gave you these servants. You had this cattle. 
I showed you how to raise cattle. I showed you how to increase your flocks. I showed you how to feed them. I showed you how to, I showed you all these things. Why am I having to take the, the worst end of the stick? So I'll tell you what I'll do, Lot. See that field over there, that nice field? That's mine. If I, see, if I catch you and your cattle on it, I'm going I'm to slaughter every one of them. I'm going to take them as mine. Now, I've had it with you. That's not what Abram did. Abram looked at Lot, and he, Abram showed meekness. Make sure my microphone's still on here. Abram showed meekness. And he said, Lot, just look around you. Pick where you want to go. If you go to the right, I'm going to the left. If you go north, I'm going south. You get first pick. Lot, and think about it, Lot... Verse 11, chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves one from another. Okay? And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. See what Lot got? Lot ended up being vexed. What did Lot end up with? At the, at the very end of this, what did Lot end up with? Zero. He lost his wife. He lost his sons-in-law. All he had was his two daughters. He ended up making him drunk. He ended up with nothing. Lot lost everything when God destroyed Sodom. His cattle, servants, everything. Lot lost it all. Now watch what God did. In, in Genesis 13, 14, the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. Now, when Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, he's not kidding. How far is north? How far is south? How far is east and west? It just keeps going. Abram and his seed will inherit the entire earth. And Lot lost everything in that. But there's, there's something else to this here. Northward, southward, eastward, and westward. One, two, three, four. Now you have, this is a spiritual thing that God is showing here. It's a proto-gospel. And, and for what reason did God give this to Abram? Abram just showed meekness is all he did. He was willing to take the loss of the, of the better land, the better well water, the better pasture ground. He was willing to take that loss for the sake of family, for the sake of brotherhood, for the sake of meekness, for the sake of the Lord's name. I think we ought to be more careful about how we drag the Lord's name into our dogfights that we get into. I think we ought to be more careful about that. We we'll always want to take the high road. Well, God, I follow God in this. I follow God's word. And the other group's going, we're following God's word. And the lost man's going, you want a beer? Yeah, let's go get a beer. And they just, they don't want any, they don't want any part of it. Want nothing to do with it. But he's showing him one, two, three, four. A city built four square. That's what God is showing him. He's showing him in the typology, he's giving him a greater inheritance. And that is the inheritance of everlasting life through the gospel. And he said, For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it unto thy seed forever. Forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise and walk through the land and the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent he came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Ebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Now, we're going to stop here for today, but just, just remember this lesson here. And that God is he's continuing his blessing upon Abram um, without Abram's works of righteousness, without his deeds, without anything. God is continuing to manifest and show Abram that he's going to bless him, that he's going to make a great nation out of him, that he's going to do these wonderful things in him and to him and through him, all without Abram's works of righteousness, all without Abram's 
obedience to what God said. We're going to get into Genesis 22 eventually where God, you know, has this final thing with Abram, this final proof of the pudding. But before that ever happens, um, let's see, where is it here? That God, that Abram believed God, at, yeah, in Genesis 15. This is even before the name change in verse 17. This is before Abram offered Isaac. In verse 15, verse in, in, excuse me, in chapter 15, verse 6, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Faith will give you God's righteousness. Works will get you about this far. And then once you break the law, your works of righteousness are gone. Ezekiel 33 makes that very, very plain. You cannot measure out and weigh out your good deeds versus your bad deeds because the moment you do one bad deed, all your good deeds are gone. So where does that leave the scale? Okay? And God hates an unjust balance. Get your finger off the scale of God with God and quit trying to make yourself out to be more righteous than you are. Don't... Listen, I love people. I don't mind sitting on the phone visiting with people, but don't call me bragging about how good you are and about how come I'm not preaching the real gospel about how you have to obey the law. Don't tell me how good you are. I don't believe you. Not for a second. I know man. I know the nature of man. I know how wicked he is in his heart. I know how deceitful his heart is. And every time somebody tells me how good they are, I just want to go, Ugh! you are not, you old wretched heathen. You wicked, hell-deserving thing, you. If God were to show everybody on a screen your thoughts, you'd run and hide like a little girl. I just, I'm, I just don't put up with it. Okay? I don't believe it. I don't believe these people go, oh, I don't bless God. I don't sin no more. Liar. Big, bold-faced liar. All right? And, Bibles, and the Bible says so. There's none righteous. No. Not one. Not me. Not you. Only Jesus Christ, the righteous. We are clothed with his righteousness by faith alone. Okay? Anyway, study this out. Take these things to heart. Go back to where I went in Scripture to see whether these things be true. Do your own study to make sure that what I told you is right. All right? You're the reason why we do what we do here. Keep us in your prayers. We appreciate those of you who can support us. Um, you know, this, this time of year, uh, we could really use it, all right? I don't beg people. I don't say, hey, we, we need this now to, to give you an amount. I'm just telling you, Lord bless you for giving, all right? We love you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <music>